right broker to take find the right broker to take advantage of opportunities in the market? Are you looking to trade shares, commodities, and even crypto? Even if you're not ready yet, you can learn more about investing on Capital.com. Capital.com is a global investment platform with over half a million traders on its platform. Visit Capital.com, that's C-A-P-I-T-A-L.com, and start trading today. Private equity broadly just means investing in, uh, in companies that are not publicly listed, they're privately owned, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then selling them off, right? So venture is... Uh, a very early, early stage, stage investment in companies that are, you know, tech oriented. Where you, within private equity itself, uh, you also have, you know, real estate private equity. You have um, uh, buyouts and leverage buyouts. You mm-hmm. have growth equity. So all of these are very different in terms of the uh, stage at which you invest. And private equity can also be specialized. You can have different industries. You can have a healthcare PE fund, an education PE fund. So it really just depend. But I would say, broadly speaking, you're not investing in startups. You're not investing in Greenfield. Mm-hmm. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Conversations with Lulu. If you are watching this, you'll see that we're in our new studio, which went live just last night. And we are super excited about it and looking forward to host so many more guests from this new space. Our guest for today is Huda Lawati, the founder and CEO of Aleph Capital, a GCC-focused mid-market private equity firm. Huda was recently voted among the top 100 most powerful businesswomen in 2024 by Forbes Middle East. Throughout her career, Huda has led deals worth billions of dollars, both in equity and debt. She sits on several boards, including the ADC acquisition company, which is uh, the first listed SPAC on the Abu Dhabi Stock Exchange, Maghrabi Rita Group, Saudi Francie Capital, and more. I'll be talking to Huda about the private equity market in MENA. What are the opportunities? What does she look for in target companies? And so much more. Huda, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we've been trying to make this work for, for quite some time now. Yes, but I'm glad to do it today when you're starting your new studio. Yes, exactly, exactly. The first guest in the new studio. So how is, I wanted to, to just maybe start by asking you, how is the entrepreneurship life going? I think it's payback is how I say it. Because as an <laughs> investor, all, all my life I spent judging entrepreneurs. Why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? You should do this. And now that I'm an entrepreneur, I, I, I see the other side yeah. of it and understand that, you know, one of the reasons you can't do everything is because there are only 24 hours in a day. <laughs> but you, when you were investing, I mean, you were working on really big deals per se. You were talking with very established entrepreneurs and family businesses. Uh, and, For the and- most part, yes. And uh, but having said that, even in those businesses, a lot of them were founder led. Mm-hmm. And a founder's plate is always full, you know, I think at different stages, because they're always thinking of the next thing. They're always trying to manage the business. Uh, now, whether that's seven people or 700 people, you still have to manage it and you still want to keep ahead of everyone else. You still want to innovate. You still want to manage performance. So I think that's that supplies across the board. Yeah. What do you enjoy the most about uh, about entrepreneurship so far? You've- about entrepreneurship, I enjoy the fact that uh, it allows you to own your decisions in a much bigger way. It allows you to, you know, a lot of life is learning from mistakes. People say we learn from our experience and that's true. But I think there's just so much more to learn from mistakes than there is from the things you do right. And when you feel, and not only your mistakes, by the way, other people's mistakes as well. And so when you feel like you're building that out with all your learnings and trying to do things better uh, in a in a more efficient way, in a more uh, empathetic way, whatever it is, I think that's very rewarding. Uh, building it out with other people, the teams you build out, I think that's very enjoyable as well. In your industry, which is the the private equity industry, how how has it been to like find your own team and 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 build that team and set the you know the right culture that you want and your company. How, how did you find hard. that process? Very hard. Uh, we have, uh, for four positions that we hired, we would interviewed 150. And wow. for a large chunk of them, we did case studies. The first person was, uh, was, a, was which, who is now my partner, Farah Mazrui. She was more of somebody I met and really res- her, her, her values resonated with me. We stayed in touch. She comes from the industry. She's so Emirati. She, she's Emirati. She was the first call I made and, you know, she agreed to come on board. So that one, I would say, was 
the the find and that wasn't that uh, longer process so that was the, the luck luck bit if you like and 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 it's been amazing to have her but together her and i have gone through a lot to build up the rest yeah, of the team yeah i was going to say you probably found the only other woman in private <laughs> equity <laughs> and the yeah. region and brought her on board yeah no, she's amazing yeah do you meet a lot of women in private equity not that many and certainly not that many on the on the uh, investment side so broadly in the industry yes but they may be in other functions not in investment mm-hmm. uh, but it's changing uh, we 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 interview women we find younger women in, you know in analyst associate positions on the lp side there are a lot of women um, okay, that's so actually also true on the US, side. which is also on the investor side the lp being the limited partner investors and in, typical investors in private equity funds US that's true as well because a lot of the limited partners or investors tend to be pensions and mm-hmm. uh, institutions etc which is a you know well uh, designed environment where they've always hired women so we do find more and more here as well uh, okay uh, that are women which is great your limited partners here typically are who the sovereign wealth funds family mainly, offices mainly institutions and within that a majority is sovereigns so let's talk a little bit about the the private equity industry um i mean especially in this part of the world mm. uh, obviously so how do you why do you think we need the private equity in uh, this part of the world what what sort of problem are you are you solving with private equity so look i think private equity is a very well established asset class globally the first private equity or structured private equity done in the us was uh, carnegie steel in 1901 okay uh, the industry here is pretty nascent it started off you know around 1000 uh, properly with that fund structure with limited partners who are the investors and gp or general partner who is the manager uh, around 2004 and has not taken off in a big way uh, the uh, asset class contribution in the overall economy or the participation is quite small compared to the uh, 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 to the rest of the world and i think that it is an interesting asset class because private equity one globally has shown to uh, outperform the public markets and importantly i think for my region and why it's so relevant today and why the sovereigns actually realizing that and focusing on it is that private equity is a great conduit of capital mm-hmm. as a um, an investor especially as a government investor you can spend a lot of money especially if you're trying to stimulate the economy but how do you ensure that that money first makes it to the base of the economy not just to the large mm-hmm. uh, you know government owned businesses or to the government infrastructure product you need different conduits of capital but with that conduit of capital you also need capability to make sure it's direct their selection is directed to the right opportunities there is value add there is knowledge transfer and private equity is able to do that because as an asset class we're so focused on the outsized return the alpha we do something which is broadly called value creation where you get really involved in the businesses and try to uh, uh, extract that additional value and to do that you have to bring in governance you have to bring in uh, organizational building best practices help business and in particular in our case as elif for example we've identified digital transformation as a key aspect of doing that in today's day and age so that's why it's an important asset class. Yeah, so go, just to uh, add on that maybe a little bit is uh, to clarify so private equity firms usually would raise very large funds they're much bigger typically than venture capital funds because you're investing at a at a much later stage in the company's journey. How much sure typically is the is the company when you when you look at it as a as a potential investment from a private equity perspective. So even within private and by the way some people would classify venture capital as a within subset private equity. Private equity. Yes. private equity broadly just means investing in uh, in companies that are not publicly listed, they're privately owned mm-hmm. and uh and then selling them off, right? So venture is Uh, a very early, early stage, stage investment in companies that are you know tech oriented where you, within private equity itself uh, you also have you know real estate private equity you have um, uh, buyouts and leverage buyouts you mm-hmm. have growth equity so all of these are very different in terms of the uh, stage at which you invest and private equity can also be specialized you can have different industries you can have a healthcare pe fund an education pe fund so it really just depend But I would say, broadly speaking, you're not investing in startups. You're not investing in greenfield. Mm-hmm. So the company is relatively mature. There's uh, revenues. Right. There's uh, there would be revenues. There would typically be profits. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, and traction you, for a few years. Right? Yeah. So you're not looking at the you know in venture you're looking for is it an idea? Yeah. Uh, has it started generating revenue? Is the product market fit has been established? No, that's not where we play. So typically the uh, in in this part of the world again. Who who is like a typical company for you? Is it uh, is it a family business that's trying to modernize? Is it uh, a small? I mean, it has to be a certain scale, right? So, yes. Uh, so for us, and we we play on the smaller side of private equity. So you do mid market. Yeah, we we do mid market. What's mid market? So mid market in the context of our region is probably micro in the context of the U.S. region, okay. but we define it as a as companies that have at least twenty twenty five million dollars of revenue. Okay. They're profitable uh, and they are uh, ripe for growth, what we call growth investing. That's our the subset of strategy we focus in, which okay. typically means that a lot of money goes into the company to drive its expansion plans, to drive organizational building. We will, as one of the things that we like to focus on a lot, we feel at this stage, you're not looking at the large cap where you're doing yeah. leverage buyouts or, or financial engineering or any of that stuff. You're really trying to invest in growth. And to invest in growth with businesses of this size, Sometimes you have to, or many times, you have to actually invest in their J-curve, which means that they... In their J-curve. J-curve. Okay, can you because, explain that, please? Because a lot of these companies, actually, the reason they, and many of them do stagnate or, or uh, are not, you know, don't mm-hmm. exist for a long time is because they get to a point at which they've sort of plateaued. Mm-hmm. And uh, they might be in great sectors, great market positioning, but they don't have either the money the capability or even sometimes the risk appetite to go to the next stage. And our job is to say, okay, we actually have enough conviction in this company, in this industry and in this team, which is very, very important Mm -hmm. to invest so that we might see a dip in their profitability. We might see a, um, a, a, you know, a path to coming back, not immediate uh, to bring back revenues and growing them, not immediately, but we have enough conviction to do that. So we will invest in technology. We will hire Better teams will, you know, bolster the, the 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 bench, and that's what we you know we focus on, and that's one, you know, in growth investing. That's quite I common. recently I just came back actually from Harvard Business School where I did a, a a short course on private equity and venture capital, and I found private equity extremely fascinating in terms of the the value that um, that you can bring to to these companies. Okay, so you look at um, you look at companies probably you said in the twenty to twenty five million dollar revenue. At least, and then upwards. And we can upwards, go, uh, okay, they are typically profitable. They have a mature team. And then you come in uh, and then you look for um, a majority stake, a minority stake. So Good what, question. What? So t- and do they usually also, maybe just to, to follow up on that, is it do they usually approach you or are you out in the market approaching people? How does it how does it work? So, so two separate questions. Let me uh, address the first one no, first because sourcing is the is an important one. Sourcing is typically um, many different funnels. We mm-hmm. are out in the market. Our first deal was a pet shop, which is the biggest pet business in the region, which is something that I was aware of the business. I've seen the trends globally in the pet space. Um, I did some research to ensure that they are replicated here in terms of the growth and the increase adoption of pets and then approach this business and said, look, we want to uh, purchase it. And we've done that in many uh, businesses that are in our pipeline today. But we also receive interest from uh, from advisors who are advising businesses, sometimes from business owners who mm-hmm. want a certain kind of help. And they've seen me do something at a company, you know, during Savola days or with a turnaround or, or during an, another part of my career, but basically or with Tim Hortons with the expansion. So people do come to you. I would say the interesting thing about private equity in this region is that unlike venture where the founders are extremely well informed about the fundraising side of things and the different now, venture funds. Yes. More recently. But also the venture funds didn't exist before. Yes. But I would say even us, we get a lot of opportunity from startup founders. So I think this because of the venture, the way that well, it is always fundraising at every stage, the venture community has built up, actually, it started later, but it's built up much faster in this region. That particular community of founders is much more um, aware of this uh, option of raising capital from funds. In our space, where these traditional businesses, they don't necessarily know about something called private equity. Mm. So it does require us to go out there and, and get some deals, but we do get deals from advisors as well. We sometimes get deals from families that we know who have something in their portfolio and they want us to look at it. Okay. So it's a combination of things. 
Now, to your question of whether we buy minority or majority, it's very situation specific. Okay. So for the most part, we're looking for strong teams. In my experience, a lot of the strong teams are in businesses that are even today founder led. That's where we found a lot of find a lot of business. Sometimes businesses are family owned. The fa- a founder may have built it up and then wasn't there. That was the case with the pet shop. Mm. Danish founder founded the business, sold it to a family and moved away. Okay. So in that case, we had a team that we brought in with us and we bought 100% of the business. Okay. Right. But I think that's rarer. Uh, a significant minority is probably the more common uh, uh, route. Okay. So and when you feel like we're, d- we're d- doing a private equity class now, yeah. when you when you're when you want to buy this business, right, it's a it's a lot of cash. So you have a, you have a fund at Alif or yeah, it's a blind pool fund that we have raised. Okay. Uh, and we uh, find companies and deploy from that fund. Okay. And when you buy this 100% of the pet shop, which I assume would be a sizable investment, do you buy it straight out from your fund uh, or yes. do, you, do you get leverage and you, you buy it? So, so very good question, Lulu. This is a very important um, uh, distinction between growth equity and leverage buyouts. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons we've had issues in private equity historically is that people mix uh, tools. Mm-hmm. So you get a toolkit from the U.S., right, or from the, the West, where the private equity is a very common asset class. And there are many things in that. Leverage or acquisition finance is one of those tools. But that is a tool that is is and should is typically and should be applied to more mature businesses, not okay. growth equity. So we're basically saying we're doing growth equity, but we're using LBO tools. And I think that's not good for the business because a business that is growing through growth, where your thesis to invest is to supercharge their growth and uh, leverage on the growth that's in their sector in the market, yeah. but you burden them with that. debt and debt financing, you're going to have bad results. And it's particularly accentuated in our market where it's a cyclical market. We mm-hmm. are, you know, we're, we're working very hard on diversification, but there is still reliance on hydrocarbons, which means we do go through uh, big cycles. Mm-hmm. And be, having being extremely leveraged in a down cycle usually takes away a lot from the core business and its growth. So, no, we do not use acquisition finance. We don't think it should be used in the growth equity story. How how easy is it? Has it been historically here in this region? You said the first uh, proper private equity fund was probably around two thousand four. Yeah, uh, that's Abraj. Mm-hmm. That's Abraj. Okay. So how how has it, how easy has it been uh, for private equity funds to to raise capital here? Look, I think it went through phases. So initially, it wasn't uh, uh, easy, but as people were trying to understand the asset class and that. It came with a certain what we call warehousing, which is you do deals first and, and then show them to people and they come into the fund. It started growing. 2007 was a peak in private equity fundraising. A lot of people raised uh, private equity funds, uh, including people who don't know anything about private equity, unfortunately. Okay. And then obviously after 2008, 2009, as the region went through a lot of difficult times, a lot of those disappeared. That's basically the... the uh, uh, the, the initial history. Then there was, I would say, a hiatus where for a long time there weren't that many private equity fundraisers. Now, I want to say one thing that is important in the context of this region, that the, there is m and activity that continues. There's still family businesses that buy private, buy private businesses and work on them. We do have a commonly in, in, uh, in the market and particularly in Saudi, a lot of what you call deal by deal fundraising. Mm-hmm. And that has been there and continues to be there. But the blind pool investing in the typical GPLP structure is not or has not been as common uh, historically. Okay, and just to clarify, blind pool is you go out and you raise a a big fund and but you don't have necessarily target companies that you want to invest in yet or you have some idea of where you want to invest, but. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to invest in it. So I'll have a pipeline. I might have one deal that I've warehouse or secured, but basically the investor is taking a view on the team. Mm -hmm and the team's capability and the strategy, as opposed to in a deal by deal case where you're like, do you want to invest in this business that I have sourced at these terms? Uh, do you want to be part of that story, which is you know, much yeah. more specific? Yeah. So, OK, since we're talking about Aleph, I mean, what are you looking for specifically? You said you invested in uh, in the pet shop because you saw that the industry trends are, are favorable. You saw that pets uh, in this part of the world are uh, becoming more uh, part of the, the household uh, and, and it's good business. So wh- what else do you look for? Is, is it, uh, what other industries are you interested in? 
So we are sector agnostic and our, our job really is to identify sectors that are uh, poised for growth mm -hmm. and then also sectors that are not overcrowded. Because, for example, healthcare and education broadly are really good sectors for this region. But there's a lot of capital that's being directed towards them. Okay. And we also look at healthcare and education, but we do struggle to find deals that are not expensive mm -hmm. because there is a lot of capital chasing uh, opportunity. But then so within healthcare, we look for niches that are interesting, uh, certain specialized clinics um, out of uh, out of home care or out of facility care. We, we believe there are certain trends driving these uh, sectors, like let's take healthcare, decentralization, you know, away from big hospitals to clinics, personalization, focus on wellness not and preventative elderly. care. Elderly, what about elderly? Elderly. I'd imagine uh, it's a... It's a, it's a big thing. It's a big segment. And as much as we are the young, one of the youngest populations in the world, our um, elderly class is actually growing at an incredible rate. So there's a lot to be done there as well. So those are all niches that we try to identify. Some of them have targets that we can look at. Not all of them do. Mm -hmm. um, but we also nurture opportunities a lot. So for example, um, transport and logistics is one of the themes that we focus on. Mm -hmm. We've identified... Uh, I would say a few businesses, two or three of which we spent time with and got close to. We didn't transact with them because they're a bit early, early at mm -hmm. an earlier stage than we want them to be a little bit earlier in their growth phase. But we've started building relationship with them in 2022 and maybe next year we transact mm -hmm. with them. So I think in that sense, it tends to be a long term focus. And are these uh, venture back type businesses and uh, logistics? They may or? Be. They, and I think in the in one of them is okay. uh, uh, they don't always have to be. Sometimes they're you know your typical business is just smaller. It hasn't gotten to that uh, you know twenty twenty five million dollar of revenue. Uh, and sometimes they're venture back, but they're fundamentally not B two C but B two B models that uh, you know that path to profitability is there. They just need to get uh, uh, re get to a certain level of scale for us to look at them. Okay. So from, from my understanding, one of the, the biggest uh, value add, let's say, of private equity company, actually two things. One is obviously the capital that will help these companies expand. But two is your ability as a private equity firm to bring the right team on board. Because from, from my understanding, usually the value that you bring is that these companies have, that you're investing in have reached a certain stage. The founder or, or the management team uh, you know, have gotten it to a, to a certain place, but maybe are unable to grow it further or need further funds, etc. How do you build networks around you as a, as a private equity firm, like to have the right sort of people on board? So when you do make uh, an investment or an acquisition or a partial acquisition? I think it's a long term investment in relationships and in people. Yeah, uh, I think one very important thing I would say is that, you know, somebody you met, like, I don't know, 20 years ago, somewhere shows up in another place and can have a great fit for a company you're investing in or something. You would never know where things come out of. So mm -hmm. I think always uh, be positive about your relationship building. Keep your networks alive. Uh, always look out for good people. Keep in touch with good people. Uh, the pet shop is a very interesting story. Tell us, how, uh, did, it, how did it happen? Yeah. It, how did you do the pet shop deal? Yeah. So two parts to it. The first is the uh, family business that had bought it from the founder. I have a good relationship with them. So you said the founder them. is Danish? Yeah. And he had left. Okay. So he had sold it partially and then fully to this family business and he had left uh, UAE. But I know that family business well and the person who was working there very well. And uh, so when I wanted to do Elif, I also wanted to start with a good pipeline of deals that I can actually secure. And I spoke to them and they uh, they said, we're happy to work with you. And, you know, they had confidence that I would raise the capital and they felt that I could help. The second phase is the management team. So when we looked at the business, we were clear that this needs a management team change, mm -hmm. right? Um, it has isn't it typically typically the case. Change not is not necess necessarily the case if it's founder led, but certainly beefing up the team and uh, closing out gaps is. You will always need to bring in certain skill sets that don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, we wanted to make a holistic change. Uh, the business needed that because sometimes what happens is that businesses get over. Um, or over-institutionalized, if I can use that term. So a business that we invest in, that's at $20, $25 million of revenue, it's not a mature business. Mm -hmm. 
it still is an entrepreneurial business. You still need that CEO who is out, who is a go-getter, who has that founder mentality, even if he or she is not the founder. They need to have that drive. They need to have that uh, mindset. Yeah. Years ago, when I was buying a frozen food business during my Savola days, El Kabir Frozen Food, that was a circa 600 million real business. After I sourced that deal, I was looking for a, I think it was a chief commercial officer, and I interviewed many people. One of whom was a gentleman called Amr Hazim, and he ended up joining Americana. He had come from a multinational uh, background, FMCG. He had also worked for BRF. So it's it's a private equity backed uh, consumer business, okay. which means that he had worked with private equity in the past, okay. which is a different you know pace, uh, KPIs mm-hmm. and, and uh, demand, let's say. Since I had met with him, he had left corporate, found a pet business, uh, Petsville, which okay. is a boarding and daycare business for pets. And this company, the pet shop, had bought a, uh, uh, bought a stake into his business. Okay. So we crossed paths again when I was looking at the pet shop. After reconnecting, and at this point I was thinking about the business thing, that, you know, if I actually saw it, put pen to paper and I signed this, I will have to find uh, a leader. Pretty much a few days within uh, being reintroduced in my mind, I was like, well, I, I think I have a solution. And it was the greatest thing, right? And and I would say there's always a little bit of luck in some of these things working out. Amr came from being, uh, you know, in multinational corporate backgrounds, being in private equity backed companies, understanding that demand and that pace of growth that's required and had been an entrepreneur in the pet space. And he loves dogs. So, uh, so you know, we, we, we managed to get him on board um, and he has uh, built and we've helped him build, uh, build a team around him many of whom have worked with him, um, uh, some people who haven't, but together we've liked those people. And it's it's been a great buildup. So, you know, it's not, I would say that there's a lot that goes into building teams, having a good network, people who will give you proper references. And that's very important, right? You know, when you interview people and you ask for references, people are going to give you a list. You're going to get that formal, yes, uh, no, no, nothing bad to say or very generic reply. But if you have a strong network and you're deep in the markets, you will know somebody who this person worked with well and have a casual, honest conversation. And I think that's really very, very um, uh, useful to have and very valuable. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's so important. I mean, because, you know, um, I know several people that uh, left their corporate jobs you know, in their 40s and their 50s. And then if they haven't invested in building that network, even if they've worked at like some of the top companies, then they really struggle to to find something else. And and I think at at that level, maybe it's it's probably not a recruiter that's going to get you that job. It's 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 your network. Or do you do you use recruiters? We do use recruiters. Uh, We've had and we've had, I, th- I think recruiters do work better at the more uh, junior levels. But sometimes if you're in a very specialized field, I mean, just going back to history mm-hmm. and other tra- uh, other uh, other fields. I mean, to be fair, the first time I interviewed Amr Hazem was through a recruiter who had okay. laid out a whole bunch of uh, uh, chief commercial officer profiles for us. So, you know, it, it, okay. it, you, so build you relationships them. with the recruiters as well. <laughs> yes, of course. Look, I think build relationships with everybody. Yeah. So long as you have the stamina and the ability, do that. It's helpful. It pays back. It's And you meet interesting people and you meet good people. Sometimes you make friends, right? Um, it's also important not to be transactional, right? There's no fun, first of all, in doing that in life. Mm-hmm. If you just are building... You mean it. transactional in recruiting? Or, or in relationships. In relationship. And networking. I need something from you. Yeah. Um, forget, I'm nice to you. And yeah. then, and forget then. the bad side of it, which is people can tell you're transactional. It's not a good way to operate. It's actually not fun to be like that. Yeah. It really isn't. It's nice to build, build your networks uh, by meeting people and getting interested in them yeah. and telling them about yourself, hearing what they do. It actually adds a lot of richness to your life. And yes, there may be a transaction that comes out of that. They may be helpful to you. Yeah. You might be helpful to them. And that's the other thing. Always also offer people to you know help. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So do you, I mean, private equity sometimes gets a, a, a reputation of, you know, being very sort of KPI driven, very uh, uh, demanding in terms of like the the growth that that this new management team uh, 
needs to deliver on. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that that's a, that's a valid reputation. I am KPI driven and I think everybody should be. This mm. is how, why private equity drives returns because they focus a lot on specific KPIs. But is it short termism or? So I was just going to say that. So I think being KPI driven is not bad. It's important for all of us in mm-hmm. the corporate world to, you know, in general, be, you know, achievement is, is uh, very well served by targets and measurements. So I think KPIs is good. Um, but the, the question is, how are your KPIs uh, uh, identified? And I think it's important to make sure that those KPIs are a good balance of short term, medium term, long term. Mm-hmm. Um, you do need uh, to achieve things in short term because you want to always be moving forward, but it shouldn't be at the expense of sustainability. It shouldn't be at the expense of the long term uh, future of the business that you're investing in. And to do that, you just have to be smart about it. And I think in, to be honest, in private equity, that I find that a little bit easier because you have a long runway. It's in the public markets that you have... Um, quarterly results mm-hmm. that you have to uh, show something, yeah, show every something. Quarter, which is which is quite short. It is very short and it t- takes a lot of um, conviction and strong managements and strong shareholder and boards to say that, no, we're focused on delivering this result two years from now. So each every quarter from now till then, you will not see it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of education and awareness. I had investor relations under me in Savola and I learned that it's not easy because you do have a lot of asset managers, analysts, portfolio managers in your face that are attacking you. Why haven't you done this yet? Why haven't you done that yet? And mm-hmm. you're like, well, I told you I'm doing it. And I told you it's a 12 month term timeline, right? It, guess what? It hasn't been 12 months. So I think in some yeah. ways, private equity does have that runway. But the concern or the reputation that you talk about is more about doing things for, you know, that will maximize returns for three years. And then we hand over a, to someone a, else, a yeah. fully, uh, let's say, um, value, bloated. <laughs> yeah, either bloated or, or, or no more value left in a business completely, uh, uh, you know, squeezed out business to the to the next owner. And I think that a good private equity firm will not do that because we are in the business of buying and selling businesses. If I buy your business or I invest with you and tomorrow we sell it to somebody and they find something that has been damaged and it doesn't have long-term value, the next person uh, I want to sell a business to is going to be very skeptical about buying something yeah. from me. So I think that a good private equity manager would not do that anyway. So interesting. interestingly, in that, in that course where I was uh, two weeks ago, they said something which I thought was uh, was unusual. They said that basically private equity companies have better governance than public uh, companies because of the um, skin in the game. So, so I think people overestimate the the uh, the impact of transparency in the public markets. Transparency is much broader than that, right? Transparency to your shareholders, transparency to your um, all your stakeholders itself is a big driver, right? Yes, in public markets, there's a level of transparency that is required, that's driven by the regulator that forces a certain level of governance and timely reporting. But a lot of that is true in the private space as well, either because you're regulated, because a lot of fund managers have to be regulated. There's there's a level of reporting that happens there. But more importantly, because people, investors have put a lot of money at work with you. You've put, as you mentioned correctly, a lot of money in any given situation. You want a big stake in it. You can own 100 percent. So you have a lot at uh, risk and we're driven by returns. We make money when we create profits. So for me to create profit, I want to make sure that there is the numbers are on top of things. The things that the the information that I'm seeing is correct. Nobody's up to anything that is not uh, kosher and uh, I'm getting things on time. Uh, We interact with our portfolio companies. I mean, ever since I was an analyst and I've always had a relationship where I pick up the phone to the CFO or CEO weekly basis if I want. Now, obviously, there's tact in that. You can't harass management teams, yes. right? Like, that's not what I'm saying you do. But you have to be helpful, build good relationships to ensure that you have that flow of information. There are formal structures, monthly reporting. Sometimes you have weekly reporting. A lot of retail businesses will have daily sales that make it all the way up to the private equity owner. And you also have a lot of uh, uh, formal uh, delegation of authority, shareholder rights, etc. And you have to, from time to time, do an internal audit and ensure that those are all respected. Mm-hmm. So we do that as a matter of, so whenever people talk about ESG, my answer was, well, 
and private equity, so G is kind of a given. Mm-hmm. That that's how second nature it is to me that in private equity governance is a given because I would not I would refuse to be part of a business where I cannot have full control on their governance. Be assured that there is a level of transparency, level of integrity you know, integrity, et cetera, that is not compromised at all. What's the funnest part of the job? Um, I think learning about new businesses all the time. Because you have to go deep, right, to understand do. the business. You do. We, you know, people get surprised about how much depth we go, go at, get into, whether it's a pet business or a hospital business or whatever it is. We get to an incredible level of depth to understand the business and its drivers. And uh, why is that fun? That's Why is that fun? I don't know, because I'm a nerd. <laughs> Uh, no, it's fun because uh, I've always been involved mostly in generalist funds. So I've changed. I've done oil and gas. I've done hospitals. I've done clinics. I've done uh, retail. I've done f and I've done. I'm doing travel. I've done pet. It's just so many different things. And understanding the mechanics of different industries, the drivers um, and the uh, trends is very interesting because you're always learning. I think the most important thing in life is to continue learning. Uh, because otherwise, it's, you know, routine is, at least to me, extremely boring. So this job does allow you to always continue learning and find ways to add value. It's not passive learning. You learn, you know, okay, how can I do this better? How can I report this better? How can I, uh, uh, you know, communicate this better? Whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I, so, you know, that constant um, interaction is interesting for me and it's fun. But what does it do to you on a on a personal level? Like what I don't know. Describe like a really exciting situation. Is it is it closing a sale? Is it uh, meeting that founder who is incredible? Like what, what you know? Yeah, I would say that the meeting people who are inspiring, who are doing things in in amazing ways, is always uh, very positive because you you have a positivity in your life. You know, I think we are all driven by our um, let's say, mindsets and our mental states to a large extent. So if you constantly have simulation, mm. you constantly have learning, you constantly have, oh, yes, there are the sort of the dopamine peaks in you getting the achievements, uh, yeah. th- then you have a positive outlook on life. Uh, yes, w- what are uh, amazing, yes, closing a deal is amazing. Uh, but more amazing than closing a deal is selling a company or seeing that first uh, set of results, um, you know, your 100 day plan being completed. All of those are are uh, because you see your work having an impact. And I yeah. think that's very, very um, uh, satisfactory. Yeah. I mean, I would I would imagine that you've you know, you've seen a lot throughout your career and you've probably worked with some of the most interesting people across the region. So you must be very hard to please, you know, when it comes to somebody meeting somebody that really uh, sparks something in you. So that, that's, I, I was trying to get to that, you know, the, the, the personal aspect of, of, of what really excites you. Look, I think, uh, and I have to say that it's not always interesting to meet the best people. It's also interesting to meet a lot of uh, not so great people, mm-hmm. people who are too arrogant to talk to you, people who are dismissive, uh, mansplainers. There's so many negative characters you come across as well. Mm-hmm. But I think just the variety of characters is interesting and it does make you appreciate the people who are good and who are looking to contribute. It's I wouldn't say it's hard to please me. I would say it's uh, hard to meet certain standards of, of achievement and um, especially productivity, etc., while maintaining a good culture. And I think that's the hard part, right? There's a lot of people who do things really well. Um, there's some excellent um, uh, performers out there. But I think to be able to do that and do it while still keeping your humanity, being a good person, keeping values is hard. Yeah, interesting. So you, um, you've worked on some really big deals before. So maybe if you take us back uh, a little bit to some of the, the, the most interesting deals that you've worked on uh, throughout, throughout your career, you said you did healthcare, you did food. So maybe like what are some of the more memorable deals yeah. that you've worked on? But the most memorable deal for me, one of the most memorable deals for me is Ajibadem, which is a healthcare group out of Turkey. This is so, a... Achibadem. Achibadem. It's that's the Achibadem. Way, uh, yeah. Okay. Which basically means bitter almond. Bitter almond. Okay. Yeah, but it was the name of a hospital. It is the name of a hospital group in Turkey. And I worked on that transaction in 2007. And I wasn't that senior, but because of different circumstances, the people who were senior to me were just not there. Some personal issues, whatever it was. 
And the senior management at uh, Ambraj at the time allowed me to run with it. And it was the steepest part. Wow, that's 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 interesting. It is. And okay. the, it was the, therefore the steepest part of my learning curve. The transaction entailed several entities that we were buying. One was listed. One was regulated by the central bank. We had... Uh, so you were trying to buy a group of hospitals? Yeah. So it was a group of hospitals that was listed. So that entailed okay. with different classes of shares, which entailed a, a mandatory tender offer. It was it, it had a related group in insurance, which was governed by central bank. Uh, it had other businesses. We had a guaranteed return. We had some acquisition finance. We wanted to secure growth funding from banks before. There were 23 transaction documents. Wow. Some of which I'd never seen before. I think I survived 2007 on an average of three hours of sleep a night, <laughs> uh, most of the time living in Istanbul. But I, I love thinking about that time from a perspective of how much I learned and what I did. And uh, uh, and it was the first billion dollar transaction private equity in Turkey. It ticked a lot of box in terms of what we were doing, a strategy. So, so I remember you, that very you fondly. De- you delisted it or you bought a part of it? We we, uh, we bought all of it. You bought it, all of it. We bought, the, the founder reinvested with us and then we basically held it for several years and it was sold uh, to a group out of Malaysia and had a dual listing in Singapore and Malaysia. And in Saudi, I know you worked in uh, with, with Savola for, for quite some time as well. You were the chief investment officer yeah. there. And Savola, for those who don't know, it's a, it's an investment company, right? That it's focuses- a consumer investment holding, I think market cap of $6 billion, give or take. And it's the it owns the largest retailer in Saudi, Panda. It owns uh, is the largest owner, one of the Q- large QSRs, Herfi. It owns Savola Foods uh, which is one of the bigger food businesses in the region that does oil, sugar, pasta. It's a diversified uh, consumer holding group. So what was very uh, enjoyable, it was a very different, it's it's not private equity, right? It's an investment holding, it's a bit of a different mindset. You're looking at, and it's listed, so you're looking at uh, earnings per share and you're looking at accretion in a different way from sort of exit and IRRs. Not to say we couldn't exit, but it was a different way of looking at things, more from a strategic mindset. At Savola, I think the, the most interesting thing for me was that I'd sourced a deal soon after I joined, which was a frozen foods business. And I uh, bought that business, but I funded it by doing uh, by selling a small piece of another business Savola owned in an accelerated book build, which was the first accelerated book build on the Saudi Stock Exchange. OK, and an accelerated book build is? Uh, an accelerated book build is um, uh, is t- in a publicly listed company when you sell place shares in a company, a big block typically, sizable, uh, between closing and opening of a market. It's done. It's done in most public, you know, advanced public markets. But at that time, it had not been done in Saudi, so we had to work with the Capital Markets Authority in Tadawal to do the first. Uh, accelerated book. Build. So so what kind of diversity are you seeing today uh, on boards of companies that you are involved with that you are uh, looking to acquire or ha- are are you seeing more more women on boards? We are seeing more on boards. Obviously the UAE there's a there's a there's a regulation. Listed companies have to have a woman on board. Okay. And that's that's had a big impact. I think there is, it's very interestingly, and, and I find that very interesting in our region, anything that is government led or public, they tend to have a much more of a focus on doing these things right. And mm-hmm. they're very focused when they're recruiting for boards to have gender diversity and and have an open pollen and go out uh, meet more um, diverse candidate mm-hmm. base. If I go back to fundamentals from an investor perspective, the, the diversity that matters most to me on the boards is capability diversity. Mm-hmm. I want people who come from the industry. I pe- want people who are good at governance, people who are good at numbers. That I think is the basic level of diversity that should be there, right? That's for business. I've obviously, if I'm creating a board for a company that I've invested in, et cetera, I don't suffer from unconscious bias. Mm-hmm. So it's always been easier for me. But when I look around me, I feel like people are making a concerted effort to uh, ensure uh, diversity for the most part and more so on the government government and public side. So, yes, it's changing and everything, but globally and regionally, uh, the pace of change is just not enough. We need to do it faster. Yeah. Is it is it an issue? Because you said, you know, they go for what's what's easier usually for them. Is it more of a network? So I know, you know, like you brought someone that you knew from your previous network to run the company that you just bought. Is it like a network issue or is it that really there aren't many women at these uh, at these uh, senior levels, let's say, that are... Uh, 
I, I think it's that function, you can tap into. I, I think it's a function of all of these things. There was this you know, phenomenon, and I'm gonna. I don't know if it was in Sweden or Norway, but it was a phenomenon of golden skirts. Golden skirts? Yeah, it was called golden skirts. Okay. Basically, What's that? there was a regulation that you have to have women on boards. And because there were just not enough women at that level of seniority or with that experience, there were these same women who were on all the boards or many of the boards, and it became the golden skirts that okay. they, they were called the golden skirts. So it's skirt. the same people pretty yeah. much everywhere. Okay. Yeah. So I don't think we have that much of an issue in finding women. I think people do talk about it a lot. Mm. I don't think it's true. I think if you look around, there are enough uh, um, uh, experienced women. Yes, they're not as as easily available as men just because of the numbers, but there are enough of them there to make it to boards because, you know, it's not like boards are recruiting on a daily basis. It's, it's it, There are enough of them out there. You just have to make an effort. Um, a network is, a, is, is definitely a... Um, point there and I don't I think that doesn't necessarily make for the best governance anyway yeah you know uh, when it comes to board you need to have a little bit more of a uh, uh, let's say formal approach to building out your boards to just rely on like oh let me get a bunch of people from my network because particularly if you're looking for independence that should be the case yeah uh. so what is your recommendation to uh, to women who are listening to this who are potentially interested in this space and in, in venture capital private equity or alternative investments what is your uh, what is your recommendation to them in terms of getting into this space and progressing and advancing? So depending on how uh, what age they are, so if they're young, I would tell them obviously you know apply to uh, to funds and work for them. Um, usually, a good segue into private equity funds for sure is uh, investment banking, sometimes consulting, because we usually prefer to get people who are a little bit more trained. Uh, and we don't uh, go with new graduates. So those are good places so to start. So in your 30s, uh, early, late 20s, early 30s, maybe is a good place to yes to start potentially. Yeah. So if you've you know come out of college, you've gone into investment banking, you've gone into uh, maybe consulting, and then you start, or you've gone into consulting, you do an MBA, and then apply to, that happens a lot, apply to um, private equity. Even if you come from operations, by the way, there are as we get bigger, I'm sure as we get bigger, we will have more and more roles on the operation side because value add is a big uh, element, but that would be the typical path. If you are, you've gone through that and you want to be in private equity, then yes, apply to funds. There are not that many. So look yeah. at a broader spectrum, family businesses that are very acquisitive, that do direct deals, sovereigns who are very active in our region and actually act many times like private equities, uh, as well as the funds. Those are all similar types of businesses and you can learn the same skill set and you know allow you to move more into funds once you you know specific uh, funds once you build that up be open to talking to people outside your um your existing employer look at what's happening elsewhere mm -hmm. be cognizant on whether or not you're a victim of bias uh, i think there's uh, there is issues on both sides of that some people say oh all of this is because I'm a woman. Some people never are completely unconscious of it. Both are, will not, you know, will, is a disservice to yourself. So be, you know, have a honest look at that. That's a hard one, though. I always get asked this question. Do you think you were discriminated against, you know, when you were fundraising, when you were an entrepreneur? And I, I don't know. Like, it's, uh, yeah. it could be happening to you without you knowing. No, I feel the same way, uh, uh, Saraha. Although in your case, I have to say that you were one of the very early uh, tech, entrepreneurs here maybe before your time right yes yes uh, so very I, early <laughs> very early and i re always remember you as the founder of nebbish i yeah. think it was called and i think the market probably wasn't ready more than anything else right yeah i mean there were uh, i always say i think there were four probably vc or five vc funds in the entire region at the time when i was uh, when i was looking to fundraise yeah. so um so yeah okay so be cognizant of of biases if uh, if, if there are biases and and do you I mean, you said when I asked you about uh, your work at Abraj, for example, you said that uh, you were always encouraged, you were always given responsibilities. You just talked about a deal now that you led. Um, do you need mentors or sponsors or is it just pure hard work and, you know, uh, Look, I think hard skills? work trumps everything. Like, okay. uh, hard work, studying. You said you worked on three hours for a year. Uh, so. slept on, yeah, slept three hours a day. So well, hard work does, is, is extremely important. Three hours you, of sleep. Yes, yeah. So. But you do need, uh, you do need people. You can't work in an organization where there's nobody there to, to, you know, give you an opportunity or support your promotion. If everybody's sort of working against you, 
then you will not be able to thrive. And that's mm-hmm. when you change organization, right? But I think for people to understand whether they support or not is not hard. You can tell, I you know I'm putting all my all this work in. Is it being recognized? Am I being appreciated? Am I giving opportunity? And you have to ask for it, by the mm-hmm. way. I'm not saying that, you know, you, somebody should cater to you. And this is more for the younger generation. You have to go out there and really work hard and get work done. It's not going to be all served to you on a silver platter. But even when doing that, you have to um, have a, a, let's say, a receptive uh, audience on the other side. So be cognizant of that. I, I I don't think that formal mentorship thing is something I've relied on, but there's a lot of people who you ask for advice, ask for mentorship or in a specific area or a specific situation. Outside of work or inside of work? Either, either. Just people who are who can support you in things that you don't necessarily understand. But it's I, I, I think that some people work better with a formal mentorship and sponsor uh, arrangement. I've never had that formally with one person, but I work with a lot of different people to uh, uh, to get the support. But I think drive yourselves, ask, uh, have a thick skin. I think that's a big one. Mm-hmm. People will say no, but, you know, just push through. Um, and yeah, just keep. Uh, uh, you know, we're trying to get up there. Even at the analyst level, uh, and when we're hiring, we're telling people that you're not a, a cog in the machinery, right? You're part of the team, you're doing your job, but take responsibility, take initiative. The more you own your work, the more you own your schedule, mm. right? Uh, and I think it's important if people, I don't like hiring people who are taskmasters. And n- nobody who's a taskmaster will last with me, no matter what kind of job. What's they have. a taskmaster? Somebody who has a task list and they just complete it. Like I've given you a thing, oh, three things like to do. Oh, tell me what to do and yes, I'll do it. Yes, and okay. Uh, I, I, I will, will hire people who are like, uh, okay, these are the, this is the project we're on. These are the things. Should we do this? Should we do not do that? Challenge what the work streams are. Take ownership of them, and then you know dial in and out with uh, me or. Um, another senior person as and when needed. So mm. self-starter is people who, uh, ownership, I think, is very, very important to me. Okay. You talked a little bit about, uh, uh, actually, when we spoke ahead of this conversation, you told me you, start, you studied neuro- neuroscience. How much of of that has have you used, you know, throughout your career in terms of the deals that you work on? How do you negotiate with people? Uh, how do you... I mean, look, I think like most undergrad degrees, it's more about gaining the skill set than the specific. So I did behavioral neuroscience, but I also did business econ. The reason I did behavioral neuroscience is that I didn't find business econ challenging enough. So I wanted to do a science degree. I think because it's a science degree and it's more analytical and, you know, it's it, 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 it more sort of um, driven by uh, science, it, 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 it does add a lot to the mm-hmm. way you look at things and your analytical skill set. Have I used it in terms of the behavioral side or the psychology side of negotiations? Probably not that much. Oh, really? Okay. I think that is probably more something you gain over uh, time with experience. Now, I have used it a lot in terms of understanding or controlling sort of how you feel about things. And a lot of our behavior is biochemical, right? Like it's, you know, your bad moods, your... And talk about people being hangry is, you know, some... You know, it's all... A lot of it is internal. So I think that mm-hmm. I always automatically do that analysis and it's helpful but it's mostly you learn on the characters on you know through your career on the job and then apply that learning okay so you're not gonna you're not gonna share any hacks with us in terms of how we can how we can uh, control ourselves better or how we can control the situation better i mean you 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 must have been in so many situations where things went wrong so uh yeah um I'm, I'm, I, I, if my husband's watching this, he will or listening to this, he will laugh if he hears me talk about controlling yourself better. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I think um, can, I, I'm, I don't know if it's a hack or not, but it definitely is helpful to uh, try to understand where the other person is coming from. And even when people are being completely outrageous, right, uh, whether it's in terms of the way they're negotiating their aggression or or. Uh, behavior. I think if you have the facts right uh, and you have good logic in terms of the way you're explaining a specific clause that you're asking for, etc., you usually can beat that by calmness. It's hard to do, but being calm in the face of somebody who is not and just sticking to logic actually puts them in quite a corner. <laughs> okay. Right. So they have to listen 
wait, what are they going to do? They're screaming their heads off and you're like, oh, but this doesn't actually make sense. Can you just tell me why you think this makes sense? And they have to actually calm down and give you a reason. And it's not easy for them. They get flustered. Mm. Because when you are in a situation, you all your, you know, your adrenaline is high, your stress hormones get high, you get worked up and you're in a room and you're forcing things to it's it can become an unhealthy environment to make an important decision. So sometimes it's just important to say that why don't we just pick this up tomorrow? Right. Let's okay. Break this. So I think that's helped me a lot. So leave it and just sleep yeah. on it, basically. Yeah. And come well, back. It does depend on what side of the conversation I'm in. Sometimes it's good to push the other side when they're in that situation to make a decision, but it depends on where you are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's uh, that's really great advice. I'm sure you've been in in in, in many situations uh, like that where I think there's a lot of egos as well when uh, when a lot of money is being uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, tossed around. Yes. I guess so. Con- controlling uh, emotions and situations. Yeah, it is. Would yeah. be very important. Yeah. Okay, Same well, good. <laughs> thank you so much, thank you. Uh, Hoda, for for uh, the great uh, sort of uh, overview on the on the private equity industry and how you work with Aleph Capital and sharing some of your experiences. Thank you for thank having you. me. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Conversations with Lulu with Hoda Lawati, the founder and CEO of Aleph Capital. To learn more about them, visit their website Alif. That's A L I P H dot Capital. Don't forget to check out conversationswithlulu.com to look at all the other episodes. And don't forget to give us a rating and a review. It really helps in getting the show discovered. And make sure you're sharing it with friends, colleagues, family, and whoever might benefit from this content. See you in a few weeks.